Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to a special installment of University Cities Exchange, developed as part of the UM Systems Extension and Engagement Week. University Cities Exchange is an ongoing collaboration between the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and the University of Missouri, St. Louis. What we do is we bring together community leadership alongside academic expertise to discuss problems and possible solutions to issues affecting the St. Louis and the Kansas City metro areas. I'm Steve Kraske. I'm host of KCUR's Up to Date. That's the NPR affiliate here in Kansas City. I'm also a professor of journalism here at UMKC. And we've gathered some of the leading voices that are working together to combat what is commonly known as a food desert. Today, we'll explore the current state of our resource availability and discuss the historical events that have led to our current issues. Let me introduce our guest now. Dina Newman is director of the Center for Neighborhoods at UMKC, and she's the founder of the Kansas City Black Urban Growers. Dina, it's nice to have you. Dr. Amy Dunlap is an associate professor of biology over at UMSL. Dr. Dunlap, always good to have you too. Welcome. Erica Williams is founder and executive director of Red Circle. That's a nonprofit working towards community betterment in North St. Louis County. Erica, welcome to, to our broadcast. Finally, Max Kaniger, he's founder and CEO of Canby's Markets. Uh, that's a Kansas City-based nonprofit taking a neighborhood approach to eliminating food insecurity. So welcome to all our guests and thank everybody here for joining us uh, here today. And for everyone else that's joined us, we'll set aside, you know, maybe the last 15 minutes of our time together for some Q&A. So please put any questions you might have into our chat, making sure to note if your question is for a specific member of our panel. So let's start our conversation with a bit of context about this whole issue of food deserts and exactly what we're talking about here. Because, hey, there are food deserts in Missouri's two biggest cities, and there are food deserts out in rural Missouri as well. Erica, our first question is going to go for you. Uh, we've titled today's conversation, Combating Missouri's Food Deserts. But recently, some have suggested that term is incorrect and that a more accurate term is actually food apartheid. Shed some light on this for us. Is this just linguistics or is there maybe more to it? Uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much for having me on today's panel. I am very excited to be here to shed some light on a lot of the terminology that we use to describe what's really a very complex issue. Um, the term food desert became popularized by the USDA, but it was pointed out that it's not as accurate as it could be because a desert is a naturally occurring um, type of atmosphere, you know, you have your sand and you have your heat and things like that. But the food desert situation wasn't wasn't naturally occurring. It was uh, happened because of things like disinvestment, when grocery stores close, when people move away from certain areas and they take the money with them, they take the healthy food with them, and that leaves an emptiness in the region. Now, I personally don't use the term food apartheid only because um the actual apartheid that happened in South Africa was a long ranging, you know, time of very, you know, uh, specific things to South Africa. What the USDA has has started using, though, is the term low income, low access, which is slightly a little bit more accurate. Still, that doesn't completely take the whole thing in consideration because not everyone within a food insecure region or food desert region is actually low income. There are some people who live in a region that have to travel outside of where they live just to get food because of the disinvestment. So at, at a red circle, we use the term um, either food swamp, which kind of points the picture to the fact that there is food in the region. There's things that people can eat. It just has very low nutritional value. And sometimes internally, we use the term food redlining zone because that kind of paints more of a picture of the, the intentionality of how people are not investing in certain areas with healthy food. Right. Well, Erica, if you're living in one of these areas, if you're living in a food desert, 
how is that affecting your life? Oh, it affects it in many ways. Um, from the microcosm of not being able to get enough food for your family in a way that is affordable, accessible, that is attractive. Um, it also affects the region itself. One thing that we learned about grocery stores, for example, is they provide a lot of jobs and sales tax revenue to a region. And when you're in a region that's not, that does not have a grocery store, you're taking all of your sales tax revenue dollars and putting it somewhere else. So you're leaving where your home is, where you're paying taxes and mortgages and things like that to go shop somewhere else. And it just impacts the food that people are able to eat on a daily basis. You know, a lot of kids grow up with eating a lot of processed convenience store gas station type food because that's what's most accessible. And that impacts a child's learning and brain development, cognition and things of that nature. So there are just several different ways that the absence of good, healthy food impacts people. Well, Dina, you've been nodding your head. So let me come to you here. You've been leading UMKC Center for Center of Neighborhoods for you know about six years now. But you've got this deep history of this topic that predates your time at UMKC. It started with your repurposing of vacant lots and teaching communities to grow food in their own neighborhoods. So is the situation that Erica is describing, is it something that's shared in Kansas City? If so, what changes have you seen since you started working on this topic? And by all means, are you seeing any progress? Yeah, so thanks, Steve. Thanks for having um, having me on the call. So yeah, I totally agree with Erica. Um, so when I started back in 2010, I was working in one of Kansas City's largest urban neighborhoods in the Ivanhoe neighborhood. And urban farming was still kind of fairly new at the time. Every now and then you would see a backyard gardener or you know someone that was growing food on a pot on a porch. But for the most part, it was kind of small scale growing. Um, at the time, there were thousands of vacant lots available across the city and they were cheap. And what I mean by cheap, I'm talking like $200 or less cheap. <clears throat> but the Kansas City foodscape uh, landscape has really changed literally and figuratively over these last few years. For first thing, one thing, I don't think you can get a lot anymore for $200 or less. Um, but, you know, you can drive through these communities of concern and you can see small, medium large urban gardens and urban farms. And you can see this diversity now of what people are growing right in the hood, if you will, right? right. There are folks that are experimenting with like figs, um, various mushrooms. Uh, there's a guy I know doing all these different types of corn. You can't eat cotton, but I know a guy that's also growing cotton. Uh, so you see this, you know, from when we started in 2010 in Ivanhoe to where we are now, yes, things have completely changed. And, and I got to say, the pandemic, if, if it didn't show us anything, it showed us the importance of food, the affordability and the accessibility. Um, and people are beginning to realize how vital the local food system can be. You know, Dina, one of the projects you and the Center for Neighborhoods are working with is that is intricately tied to this is an urban development called the Palestine Corridor. When people, you know, think of urban development, it's often a vision of, you know, skyscrapers and apartment complexes, but you've got something different going on there. Tell us about it. So the Harlan Conservation Alliance identified um, an area in Kansas City's urban core that there are 40 acres of urban forests. A lot of people don't realize that, and I almost kind of hesitate to highlight it, but it's such an amazing uh, project. The Palestine Quarter Project is a community-engaged reimagining of what this 40 acres could look like. Uh, we put together a community advisory board of residents. There's faith-based leaders, environmental, environmentalists. And almost for two years, we've been looking at what that space could be like. The forest is pretty much untouched, but there are areas where there's been illegal dumping, there's overgrown brush, there's trash. But it is beautiful with possibilities, not skyscrapers, not apartment complexes, but an urban nature sanctuary, if you will. The advisory board came up with two different concepts, but both concepts included this idea of growing food. One concept, they had a farmer's market, playgrounds, a walking trail. And then the other concept was, and they haven't used this term yet, but it's really much more like a food forest. So there's like many different species of trees growing in there. And they were like, OK, this would be great for uh, garden space, composting, 
uh, nuts and berry bushes and bee boxes. So it's beautiful, two beautiful concepts that, again, are looking at ways of growing food right in the urban core. Huh. Well, Dr. Dunlap, I just heard the term bee boxes, and I wanted to ask you about that. You know, pollinators is your area of expertise, and it's really where this whole conversation on food starts. Why is the concept of pollination so important, specifically when we're talking about urban food deserts? Yeah, so pollination is how most plants reproduce. And this is where the pollen is brought from one flower to another flower. And from that, a fruit is formed and seeds are formed. And many of the fruits and vegetables that we grow rely on being pollinated by an insect like a bee or a hoverfly. And this is how the plant produces the berry or the apple or the pea pod. We have some other plants like our grains, and this is where the pollen is carried by wind, but in these cases, the, the pollination can be made more efficient with insects. Um, native bees are pretty critical for this, and they're actually required for types of pollination that honeybees can't do. For instance, we need our native bees to pollinate tomatoes. And there's so much research now, it's made very clear that our native bees are both efficient and effective pollinators for a range of crops. You, you know, whenever you hear about bees these days, you always hear that they're in trouble. Are they in trouble in Missouri, Dr. Dunlap? A lot of our native bees are in trouble, and they're in trouble in ways that we're only starting to grasp. Missouri has over 400 species of native bees. Wow. You probably didn't realize this. They're all different sizes and all different shapes. And many of them are really critical for our pollination needs. You know, it's estimated that nationwide, like over $10 billion worth of pollination services are provided by our insects. A connection to food deserts, though, is that, you know, for instance, here in St. Louis, we have 200 species of bees. And if you look at the areas of St. Louis where we have very high bee diversity, that actually overlaps with many of our food deserts. So the, the bees are here, they're here with us and they are ready to pollinate. So, it, you know, if we take care of our bees, they are ready to take care of us. You know, doctor, you mentioned um, to one of the folks putting this uh, panel together that you live inside of a food desert yourself. Does that impact the way you wind up doing your own research? Yeah, it's really affected my research in terms of the direction that my lab has been taken more recently. I, I first started volunteering in a community garden in my neighborhood, the 13th Street Community Garden, and also helped grow crops for the North City Farmers Market, which is a small produce stand in the neighborhood. Um, talking to a lot of my neighbors and hearing about how, you know, 30 years ago there was a grocery store, they tried to get a grocery co-op going, you know, and then seeing all of my neighbors and what people are, are doing, these amazing farming initiatives, all of this work has made me more aware that we have these havens for bees that are scattered in otherwise very urban areas, like the food forests that Dina was talking about. So we've collected data on bees, like what are they doing? How are they behaving and their choices of flowers? What's going on in their brains? You know, all from lots of community gardens and farms around St. Louis. And now with collaborators from around the city, we've got a more community-based project on how to maximize pollination in urban orchards. Hmm. And so, you know, this is kind of going from the theory about how animals should make decisions to what are the implications of that behavior coming down to, in, in, this case, in the case of our orchard project, fruit production which is quite variable in the city. Some days it's, some years it's really good and some years it's really poor. So kind of cracking that problem and making sure that things are being pollinated and what it takes to, to enable that pollination to happen in a way that uh, community orchard people can make happen without a lot of effort. Hmm. Um, it's, it's a fun project and it's, uh, I hope we can make an impact on at least one aspect of this pollination. Yeah. Well, Max Kaniger, it's interesting to me. Dr. Dunlap is obviously focused at the beginning of the food chain, but you're at the other end. You're looking at uh, creative food distribution strategies around Kansas City. Tell us a little more about the history and what your vision for Canby's markets was 
at the beginning and sort of where it's arrived uh, today. Oh yeah, Steve, I would be I'd be thrilled to do that. And then first I gotta say how how grateful I am to to be here with so many incredible people on this panel. Um, because that's that's a big part of the the, the history of, of candies. Uh I mean I started this work because I I care about food. I, I love food, I love how it brings people together. And um it actually started with with for me what was a, a bad idea in that I thought I could come in and be like, well, I'll just open a grocery store. That that shouldn't be too challenging. Um, then I realized that no, nobody was going to give a 24 year old tens of millions of dollars to open a, a grocery store. Uh, it just wasn't going to happen. And, and so it forced me to spend time actually going and, and learning more about the history of, of what had happened in and around Kansas city, getting to know people like Dina and, and asking questions, seeing the work that she had been doing for so long, seeing, you know, how, how challenging it is to, to build out uh, community gardens and urban urban farming and, and the work it takes to grow enough food to feed people. Um, and then on the other side, um, like what Erica mentioned, getting to know people that are, are shopping typically at convenience stores at the like local gas station and things like that. And you see that there is there is this distribution issue. There's there's all this food out there. There's all this care and community around it. And people want to do do well and eat well. And so uh, with Canby's, we wanted to come up with a model that, that supported the small businesses that were already there, that supported the infrastructure that had been a part of these communities, um, while in the best way possible, supporting the, the local farm system and, and reducing waste on the kind of more massive like wholesale farming industry um, and how we as an organization could really fill a gap. Um, and from there, Canby's is, has, has grown and we're, we're now distributing to over 40 convenience stores uh, five days a week and getting uh, a whole lot of healthy food in, into the community. You know, when you began, Max, did you have any idea that this thing would grow into what it's become today? Uh, I, I had a lot of hopes for that, but I, I, I like to I like to dream big, and I still have some big visions of where it can go. I, I still think that that we have a unique model that could be re- developed and replicated across the country, and that Kansas City and and city there, the state of Missouri, could be really a model for how a a good and equitable food system um, can and should run. Um, did I think it was going to be here like this? No. Deep down, I, I was like, yeah, this is a, a shot in the dark. Um, I hope it can get there. Um, I, w- I want to dream for it. But to see it come to fruition, it's still like I, I feel like I have to pinch myself every time I go into the office because uh, to walk around and see so many people like moving food and, and volunteers sorting through produce and the different ideas that are flowing, it, it's it's a dream come true. You know, you mentioned uh, the possibility of looking at a, a nationwide um uh, your model could work nationwide. Have you taken steps in that direction yet at all, Max? Slow, slow baby steps. Um, Cause I do, it's, it's something I want to, I'm uh, somebody who likes to think big. And so we've, we've started speaking to organization leaders in, in other cities and, and other States, um, you know, maybe going across to Kansas would be a good first step and into cities like Wichita or even up to Detroit or Atlanta down into Florida, maybe up onto the East coast would be some fun next steps. Um, but I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I don't want to run too fast towards this big solution and leave behind the the wonderful people and community that have gotten us here. And I still think we have some work to do to make sure that we're listening first and, and continuing to develop this model and, and what I believe to be a, a solution for an equitable food system around the, the people that, that we're here to serve. Max, you mentioned this idea of food waste, and I know that's a topic that often comes up when People talk about food donations. Can you talk a little bit about how you manage food waste and the fruits and vegetables that uh, wind up not getting sold? Yeah, absolutely. So we uh, we rely heavily on volunteers. So if anybody uh, listening to this today has got some extra time and love to come down and volunteer, uh, we need you all the time. Um, but we, we really do. So, so for us there, we saw that there's so much excess food in this system that can really be leveraged to provide, um, good quality food at really affordable prices. So we have volunteers that come in um, to our warehouse and they kind of triage large amounts of donated food from the wholesalers. So wholesalers will, will donate a pallet of, of, let's say, apples to us. And um, it's really apples that they think are, are getting close to or beyond um, what a grocery store might be able to take. And they don't have the manpower, the capability to go through it. Um, we, with the help of volunteers, can't. So that first 
best quality apple that we triage and sort out of that palette is what we send out to our healthy corner stores. So that's something that you'd see no quality difference between what we have in our stores and what you find in any other grocery store. The next level down is food that is still perfectly good to eat and stuff I would love to eat all the time, but it's not quite something that, that hits that quality or that it's not something we're proud to sell. And so that we um, actually donate out to around 35 different organizations a week that are making meals out of it. Um, next level down, we work with um, food that is, is again, kind of beyond human consumption, but still maybe good enough for, for animals. And so we work with like the zoo and Lakeside Nature Center and a few farmers and some other animal rehabilitation centers to try and get as much food to be eaten by somebody or, or some animal as we can. And then everything else that is is kind of beyond even um, animal consumption, we make sure to compost. So because, again, we have volunteers that are coming in and sorting through all of the food that comes in. If, you know, the grapes that come in plastic bags, we can take the grapes out and compost the grapes and make sure the plastic is washed and recycled and that the cardboard box that they came in is also bailed up and, and recycled. So trying to, to think through the the whole system as much as possible and be as, as zero waste as we can. But there is a ton of food waste out there and and so yeah. we're we're still barely scratching the surface uh, dr dunlap we had a question come in on the chat uh from donna wondering uh she says dumb question no such thing as dumb questions here believe me i ask dumb questions for a living what's the difference between a native bee and a honey bee and can native bees be kept in a bee box or some other something else yeah that's actually a great question <laughs> that's a question I hear frequently. So our okay. native bees are the bees here in North America that evolved here and have been here for some time. Honeybees were brought over on the ships coming over from, from Europe in the 1600s. And so native bees are not, uh, honeybees are not native to here. Honeybees are weird because they do live in these big giant colonies and most of our bees do not. We have bumblebees that live in small colonies. Um, but typically not in a box that we put out for them. You've probably seen the bee hotels. And those are for stem nesting bees. So as long as they're, you know, six to nine inches long, uh, you know, reeds or, or straws, you can, um, you can encourage bees to nest in there. Or even better, just leave your yard a little messy. If you leave the stems up, you're going to have an awful lot of bees that are going to nest in those stems. And then, you know, 70% of our bees are just solo bees that nest in the ground. So having some grass kind of cleared, you're able to open up some nesting habitat for them. So the cool thing about the native bees is that you don't have to do too much to uh, encourage them to do really well where you are. Do native bees make honey? They do not. <laughs> so okay. honeybees make honey. There are native bees in South America that make honey. Um, the only bees we have that store any kind of nectar are bumblebees, and I really wouldn't drink that. So yeah. they're just kind of like nectar stores. Mm -hmm. Erica Williams, I wanted to follow up on something that Max said. Um, he said early on that he had decided against a community grocery store and setting that up. The nonprofit you lead, a red circle, is actively pursuing that option. What can you share with us about that initiative and the impact that you hope to make going in that direction? Yeah, absolutely. So a red circle um, formed a social enterprise LLC to allow us to open a grocery store that will sell serve as a typical grocery store that will um, try to sell as much local produce and local you know products, jams, jellies, things of that nature as possible. It will be a distribution site for our farmers. So in addition to the store part of the um, uh, site, there will be cold storage available for our local farmers, a demonstration garden, and then it will also include a bistro and some space for cooking demonstrations. So we are looking to um, kind of mitigate the disinvestment that occurred over the past 30 years or so. You know, when I grew up in the region of North St. Louis County, we had three major grocery stores that we could shop at from my house. And eventually those stores closed and moved away and uh, opened up the door for more dollar stores and family stores. And so the market, the people market, economic market is ripe for a grocery store here. Um, 
we currently have a group called the St. Louis Metro Bus, Metro Market Bus, that is like a grocery store on wheels. They come once a week and park at a certain spot and people can line up and go onto the bus and shop, but they want, you know, daily shopping. They want somewhere where they can shop daily. And based on the market research that we've done, we've been able to um, really, really determine that not only will the grocery store bring in food for the region, but it'll bring in more jobs, it'll bring in more tax revenue, which is why we're doing it as a social enterprise and not from the nonprofit side, just so that we can collect sales tax revenue. Mm -hmm. Just remind everybody, if you want to, uh, you have a question you want to ask, a comment you want to make, uh, please feel free to load it up in the chat feature. And there was a question that came in from Max Kaniger. I know, Max, you've responded to it, but uh, Brandis wants to know if you want, if she wanted to start a solution similar to yours in our local area, it's not Kansas City, do you provide any education or resources or even plans on how to get something like that launched? We are working on a more concise kind of playbook that we can send out to any and everywhere across the country. Um, for now, though, it, please feel free to, and I added my email into the chat, so feel free to reach out to us directly, and and I'm happy to think through it with you because every city and community is a little bit different. Um, but but we are, we and our, and our whole team want to see this model grow, and we want to see good food get where it can, and so we're here to help. Let me do this. Let me just shift our conversation now to uh, how we can respond to the crisis that we're talking about here. And any of our panelists can answer these next couple of questions. But what can uh, the average Missourian do to help with an issue like this? Is there is there a step people can take? Steve, I'll, I'll start. Yeah, Dina. yeah support, support your local growers. You know, there, there's some food that folks are growing right here in town um, on their farms. Please support your local growers. That That's one of the most important things you can do. How, how do you do that, Dina? Well, some folks go to farmer's markets. There are folks who have CSAs, for example. Um, there are other places that are just, you know, you can go into a community center um, and they may have food sitting there. And it's, uh, you know, you pay what you can pay. Cambies. Um, I just had someone yesterday go into a corner store and came back and was saying, did you know about this fresh fruit and vegetables at this little corner store? And I'm going, yeah, I did know about it. And it was their first <laughs> time. And I know Max has been around. Max and I go way back. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, support Canby, support your lo local growers, your farmers, your CSAs. Max, what would you, yeah, Erica, go ahead. Then I'll go to Max. Okay, I'll just say, I'll just add on to what uh, Dina mentioned about definitely supporting local growers. And that can be either from the individual standpoint or it can be from the restaurant and other larger institutions standpoint. One of the things that we've started doing at A Red Circle is eating more seasonal and eating more locally so that we're not relying on food from coming from so far away. Because oftentimes when food comes from far away, there's too much of it almost. So it's kind of like this catch catch 22. There's a food, desert food and security, but there's also an overabundance of food. And so people can begin to scale back and actually like eat what they will, grow what you will. If restaurants can actually buy what they need instead of buying in large quantities, if other like larger institutions like hospitals and colleges can buy according to what they would actually make and not just in big, large quantities, that will actually help because then you're using your resources more effectively. Hmm. Max, what would you throw out here? I would one echo wholeheartedly what both Dina and Erica said, that those are unbelievable ways to, to help and they make a big difference. Um, I guess I would add to it to, that the food system really does touch everybody and everything. And so if you're still like thinking, well, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could do this. Um, do, do what you can. If there's something, everybody's good at something. Everybody brings something to the table. And if there's something you care about and, and can get involved, whether if it's, if you're good at, at digital marketing, if you're, if you're good at, at, at sales or design, if you're good at sharing things on, on Facebook, you can, you can share what the work that we're doing or tell your friends about it. Um, there is something that everybody can do to to help spread the word and and get involved. And I, I would say, do what you care about and what you love, but do it intentionally. You know, Max, from a larger perspective here, given the growth of Canby's markets, are you seeing 
sort of just a broader recognition among among people that eating healthy just makes a lot more sense? And is society moving that way slowly? Are you, is, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it's a, it does make sense. And maybe I'm, I'm biased or hopeful or optimistic, but I, I, I believe that genuinely, yes, that we are moving in the right direction, that, that society as a whole cares more about eating healthy and, and, and again, being intentional about the food that we eat, uh, again, because of the work of like the people on this panel with me that has been happening for years and years now, I, I feel lucky to have gotten into this work when I did, because that, that's why I think we've been able to grow so quickly. And we'll continue to head that way. You know, Dr. Dunlap, another question in the chat, you know, providing a food source is one thing, but the knowledge of what to do with the food, how to prepare it, how to preserve it, that stuff really isn't currently taught in our public schools. Are we missing a good bet there? What needs to change on that front? I think there's been a bit of a resurgence on people's interest in preserving and canning. And I want to give a shout out to MU Extension. That's where I learned food preservation. I took one of their uh, big one day classes and uh, I've been canning things ever since then. So, I mean, I, I think it's complex what's happened in K-12 education. Um, but I think there are plenty of things that are possible with like the cooking demonstrations and other things that have been mentioned. Um, it's, it's, it's great to grow kale, but what do you do with it? Right. <laughs> so yeah. um, I think sharing that knowledge about cooking and cooking in a healthy way and uh, and all of the great ways of preserving things, which also make awesome gifts. Um, what else needs to happen from a macro perspective to sort of move things forward, to shift our society into rethinking uh, food waste, rethinking healthy food? What else, where else do we need to, to to think about and consider as we mold this topic here today? Max, I might throw yeah. out, uh, 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 funding also, I think, needs to shift to be in a more macro level. Um, I think with all of our organizations, we do we all have lots and lots of ideas, and and for us, I know we're we're moving kind of at the the pace we can we can fundraise for um and for like some of the smaller farms in particular the grants that are out there and available are designed to be in the maybe five to ten thousand dollar range and that it stays small and and micro rather than macro and systemic so a need for smaller grants as opposed to no. big dollar no need need for bigger ones because it's it's small dollars that are available and so small oh, so work happens with small dollar yeah, so having big dollars helps all, all of us have, move, move a lot faster. Anybody else on this one? Yeah, Erica? Yeah, I'll say um, one of the things that we're going to be starting next year is kind of a messaging campaign, a PSA, if you will, about the food system, you know, with disinvestment of resources, especially when uh, the disinvestment in, uh, occurs in certain communities, then the people in that community feel like they don't belong in the food system. And so oftentimes when you see commercials or any, you know, social media posts about farmers, about people eating healthy, about cooking healthy, it's a certain demographic, it's a certain, you know, look of the people. And so we want to be able to show people that everyone belongs in the food system. Everyone belongs in this good food system. And, you know, it doesn't matter whether you make a lot of money or a little money or, you know, you are a certain race or size or ethnicity, any of that stuff matters. So we're going to be like really showing people, like really helping to hoping to invite people. Because back to your point about cooking and things of that nature, when grocery stores leave and all that's left is the processed microwavable food, then that's a whole generation of people that grow up not learning how to cook, not learning, you know, about pots and pans and ingredients and cooking with herbs instead of salt and things of that nature. And so we really want to bring things kind of almost back to back to the beginning, back to the basics, growing food and cooking food and seasoning food and showing that everyone can belong in this food system and everyone can be healthy. It doesn't have to be expensive. And unfortunately, during that time of disinvestment, healthy food was weaponized and, you know, you would only see um, people who look more affluent eating healthy food and whereas the other things that were in that were left over were the really bad junk foods, the fast foods and drive throughs and things of that nature. So we want to be able to show people, you know, no matter 
who you are, no matter where you're from, you belong in the food system. And these are the ways that we can show you how to make good food possible for your families. Anybody else on this one? Yeah, Dina. Dina, I think you're muted. Thank you. I thought I had. There you are. Um, so, yeah, I just want to add, when we talked about the funding, and I think someone had thrown something in the chat about that. Yes, big grants are needed, but also smaller grants. And I call them micro grants because they're, you know, I'm putting on my black urban grower hat and we have, um, you know, small black urban growers who are just, you know, just just starting. So maybe they need five hundred dollars for seeds, for organic seeds to, just to get going. Right. Or they need a bridge loan. Those smaller grants are extremely important, and and I, I'm pushing for those smaller grants. The larger grants, absolutely. But sometimes what comes with those larger grants are a lot of hoops you have to jump through. Um, to put it bluntly, um, sometimes it's a reimbursable grant. There's fifty thousand dollars out there you can get it, but guess what? We will reimburse you on our timetable. If we come out and we like what we see. So there, there are some challenges there. Um, um, yeah, someone says more money, less hoops. I know that's, yes, Erica, that's right. So yeah, I, I just wanted to point that out. Um, and also land development. We have to look at land development as we think about, um, you know, what, what needs to shift in society. You know, every lot does not have to be built on. Every green space does not have to have, you know, a house. Have let's look at how we are developing land in the city, and and have um, you know open dialogue about how do we continue to grow for grow food in our communities. You know, it, it seems to me there's um, maybe something of an elephant in the room that we haven't addressed yet, Doctor Dunlap, and that's this idea that, at least as I've always understood it, that healthy food costs more money. And we're talking about communities that sometimes don't have a lot of extra money to buy healthy food. And I'm wondering, how do we how do we address that tension that exists as we're sitting here talking about this important topic? Yeah, that's a huge one. <laughs> I mean, you know, becoming a college professor means going through a lot of years of below poverty wages, and it was expensive to buy vegetables like. The food I wanted to eat was not the food that I could afford. Um, farmers markets can be cheaper. Um, the produce stand in my neighborhood, um, we take EBT and like everything's a dollar. And that's because it's grown by volunteers with donated seeds. That's not very scalable though, because as you scale things, you need staff. And as you have staff, you need grants that last longer than two years so that then you don't lose staff and you lose this gigantic, awesome program that you built. Um, so I guess I don't have an answer other than to say it, it's really hard to fix, even if you're thinking about just the level of your own neighborhood. Right. Um, but I think some of my co-panelists have given a lot more thought to this. Well, I was going to say, Max, this is your world. You're on the front lines of this of this question. How are you managing that? Yeah, and it is, it's a great question. And, and I, I don't know if there's one single solution because I think, you know, opportunities to do more of, of um, like what Dr. Dunlap mentioned are, are huge and important. We're managing it by, again, kind of leveraging excess to offset when we sell things at below market prices um, so that we are able to set our price point in our stores more on on what the people in the community community can afford rather than what we need to turn a profit and keep lights on. Um, I think again, at, at scale um, and more historically, if you want to look at our our food system, we we do subsidize quite a bit of of food like products. Um, there's a lot of money going into that that isn't going into what would be more the specialty crops, which are you know, broccoli is a specialty crop. And if, if that continues to in that direction, it's going to really be hard to, to see change at, at a bigger and more macro scale. Erica, what do you say about this, this elephant in the room that we're talking about here? Yeah, I'm, you know, echoing what Amy and Max have already said and, and Dina, um, there's so many resources, but part of it is getting a hold to them. 
and finding out who's doing what and where and really looking at the issue from through different lenses. Hyperlocal helps like uh, how Amy mentioned in her neighborhood. But then looking at the looking at the state, I mean, there's in here in, in the, the the St. Louis region, we have two huge schools, WashU and St. Louis U. And then we have also UMSL and the other schools. And so there's just so many resources that can be leveraged from volunteers to joint grant opportunities that we can apply to. And back to like what Max said, there's subsidies are always happening in like corn and wheat, soybeans and things of that nature, but not necessarily for food. And so if we can begin to, even if it's for a temporary, you know, 10 to 20 year subsidized food to help us like turn the tide to get more food growing for people to actually consume and less um, food sources, that would really help to bring down the prices of food. You know, Dina, Kitty points out again in the chat that sometimes red tape is getting in the way of uh, our ability to focus on supporting local growers. Tell us about that part. I don't know anything about that. Tell us about that and what needs to be done to cut through that going forward. Well, you know, depending <clears throat> depending on the farmers, there there you know you can't just like grow your food and just go to market. There are other steps involved. There's cost involved. Um, you know, some of the larger markets there's vendor fees that you have to pay. So there's all these different things. Some in some places you have to have a business license to be able to sell. So there are there are systems in place, right, that makes it a little more difficult than just going and buy a piece of fruit or vegetables. So those those are some of the challenges that um, you know we need to look at, and, and, and some of that some of that red tape. You know, to grow your food, people think you put it in the ground. Well, there's water, right? And Kansas City's water bill, I don't know if I should say this public, is expensive, right? So you're paying that water bill to get this food. And teaching growers, um, when I was in Ivanhoe, it was like looking at the entire cost of what was involved in growing. You have a water bill. You have labor. Right. Someone has to go out there and pull those weeds and, and, and take care of the of the produce. These are costs that are built in. So some people say, well, yeah, it's much more expensive to buy this food. But when you look at the overall cost, that's usually not the case. That is usually not the case. Are some of the rules in place, Dina, are, are, are they there for a good reason? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we talk about someone had mentioned GAP certification. There's a certification if you're going to grow organically. And it's super. I don't know. I think back in the day, it was like seven hundred dollars or something. I think it's much more than that. And that is because you don't want to go to a farmer's market and someone hasn't you know done the right process and you end up getting sick. So there are processes in place that I understand. Um, I will say that it's important. You don't always have to go to the large farmer's market. There are farmer's markets. There are, there are you know, in, within neighborhoods. I know for myself, some of these smaller neighborhoods have small farmer's markets. Most of the time, the food is not as expensive as some of the larger markets. Support those, support those growers and those markets as well. Erica, what about red tape? Um... Some of it is, you know, from different perspectives. Some of it is some of the grant red tape. Like, you know, I think I think it was Dina that mentioned about grants being reimbursable. You know, that we first got a grant from the Missouri Department of Agriculture for, I want to say, $19,000. And it was in 2020. And, you know, we didn't have $19,000 to put up front to start our work. And so we had to be really creative. But then some of the other things are, you know, like the red tape can be necessary, but there should be programs to, ask to help small farmers offset the cost for those red tapes, like food safety classes and things of that nature. Like, you know, we definitely don't want people getting sick, but if you're growing food and trying to feed the community and overcome the disinvestment that has occurred, you should be able to get some type of support for that and not be punished because you're too small to pay for certain classes or certain certain certifications and things of that nature. So I think there are just ways that if some of the larger institutions have the funds to support smaller growers, smaller operations, they should really work to see how they can leverage and, and do that. Even if it's just one crop, 
you know, you say you're going to buy 1% of your green beans locally, then let's get some farmers together. Let's think of some type of a procurement process to get these farmers together, see what kind of land they have, what kind of infrastructure they have, what they need, if, you know, if, if they need cold storage, if they need water support, if they need maybe, you know, seasonal people to help pick the green beans. But just like, let's just do something to actually get started and not just think that it's such a big thing that we can't overcome. We can start with just one crop, one school, and one set of neighborhoods. That'd be a good place to start. You know, again, Max, you're on the front lines of this. Have you had to deal with a lot of red tape to get started and to do what you do in terms of distributing food around the community? Yeah, absolutely. Absolute. Red, red tape's a, a part, of, part of the process. I am um, not the best rule follower, and, and I think I ask for forgiveness decently well. Um, so I don't know if I would advise people to do it the way I've done it, where it was just kind of like, oh, I didn't know I couldn't do that. Yeah, I'll get the paperwork done now. But um, sometimes uh, thinking you're doing it right and having them tell you it's wrong is the fastest way to find the actual right paperwork that you're missing. Because if you're just doing research, you, you don't even know what you're missing it's not half the time. Um, and I do, I think, you know, systems are, are there to, to protect us and there should be good consumer protection in place. I want to feel confident when I go to a farmer's market that it's something I can trust, but it shouldn't come at the hindrance of, of progress and at the detriment of the, of the small businesses. And where do you see that line today? Is it too much red tape? Is it, is it gone too far or not enough? Uh, depends which thing in particular, because you're asking about, because it, it's both and it, sometimes it's too far. Sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes it depends who you're working with at the city or the state, who the official is, because sometimes you pick up the phone and you can talk to somebody who is unbelievably helpful and seems really not knowledgeable and caring. And they are there to be an advocate for you. And they, they know what it takes and what it takes to get you across the finish line. And it makes the process a breeze. And then I'm all for the red tape. Other times you get somebody who who seems like, and maybe they're just having a bad day and they're just not wanting to deal with it, but you can talk to somebody and you feel like you go nowhere. You spend hours and hours or weeks and weeks and and you're still, you feel like you went backwards. Hey, can you give us an example of, of where the red tape feels onerous to you? Uh, the red tape I, for us right now, um, we, we're looking at, again, crossing into to like moving across state lines. And so we're looking at, at like some of the like DOT stuff and there's now state and federal and city things at play and, and none of the different areas seem to talk very well to each other. And so making sure I have the right licenses because I do, I want to make sure that we're doing things right and above board, but even just finding all of the information and all of, again, like, have I done everything? I mean, some days I'm terrified the health department's going to show up and shut us down. Other days, I can't wait for the health department to come and tell me what I'm doing wrong so I can fix it and do it right. So in other words, you might be thinking about going over to Kansas City, Kansas, which might have its own struggles with food. And you're saying crossing mm -hmm. the state line is a huge, a huge issue for you. Yeah, it was a it was an issue for us, even as we started working with a different wholesaler and we wanted to start picking up food. And it is you can basically see this whole from our warehouse. It is a five minute drive, but they're just into Kansas and going to get food, whether to purchase or donate and have it come back over into our warehouse was a whole new set of, of rules. Uh, Gidget writes this in the chat. We need to educate the public that even if the produce is a few cents more expensive, at the farmer's market that we are supporting local community members and that the produce is freshly picked and has the most nutrients. The perception is that it should be cheaper because it's local and no middlemen. Dina, you're nodding your head. We, we have an education challenge here. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, you know, and, and people need to realize that, um, again, these are people working. I mean, they're out there in the heat and in the sun and dealing with bugs and snakes and the whole thing, right? This this is a job. And I don't know of any grower who's getting rich off of this. Seriously. I mean, they're out there. It's a passion. It's love. It's want to give back to the community. So yeah, I think there is an education gap there that maybe that's what we need to work on is, um, you know, in this space, letting people understand the, um, the actual value of, um, of locally grown produce. Dr. Dunlap, Mary makes an interesting point. Uh, one of the biggest conundrums in our food system is that food is simultaneously too cheap and too expensive, too cheap for farmers and others to achieve secure livelihoods while expensive for people to eat healthy. 
perhaps we need to really think about innovative policies that could address that conundrum somehow, like double up bucks programs at farmers markets. What's a double up? What's a double up bucks program? If Max is, what is that, Max? I might be the least qualified person here to talk about it, but double up food bucks is is an incredible program that that is in actually there's something similar, I think, in most every, if not all states by now. But um, and I do I see uh, Donna Martin. uh, She is she's the the one who really should be up here talking about it because it's it's really where if you're buying local and real healthy food, so fresh produce with your food stamps or EBT cards, um, they double the value of it. So for us, let's say you like like strawberries were three dollars um it would be you would only use a dollar fifty of your uh, benefits and the other dollar fifty would still be covered by the program dr dunlap this idea that food's too cheap and too expensive all at once does that resonate with you it sure seems to i i just want to echo what dina said it's hard to grow food <laughs> so um i do a lot of volunteering with my you know I got certified as a master gardener a couple of years ago. I garden in my own yard. There, it's hard. <laughs> it is so hard to grow food, and and to have a reliable harvest. I mean, I think this year, just any gardener you talk to is a crap year for tomatoes. You know, even from a home garden, things weren't what we thought it was going to be. Um, it's it's tough to be a farmer, and I, I think that no matter what kind of agriculture people are in, they should be paid more. <laughs> Um, yeah. You know, Brandis asked us this question. Again, it strikes me as a good one. Can we talk about the discrepancy between the amount of money given to the grower and the profit that food distributors get? Growers often get a few cents while the uh, food distributors get dollars for the same item. That's like the question that, you know, you might have a, a musician, you know, the promoters and, and the, uh, you know, the studio execs get all the money and the artists don't get much at all. Max, does that resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 like like a lot of different industries, um, there is there is money available. There is a way that this system can be equitable, can be fair. There's a way that that food can be both affordable and accessible to the people all over, and it can also have a a decent lifestyle livelihood that it can provide or afford the the people growing it. Um, it just needs some shifting around. And unfortunately, like uh, a lot of the policy is, is like post World War II. And so it does, it favors some of those big commodity crops and grains and, and doesn't have a lot of, of different incentives there for the smaller farmers that are feeding us. Um, and if, for me, I think I think the best way to change that um, is is for uh, community organizations like all of the people here with us and the people here listening to push for for that change and to be loud about it because that's that's where we can start to shift where the dollars all end up. But all the political clout, Max, would be on the on the distributor side, right? They're the ones making donations to politicians. Yeah, once once you're the the big guy, it's it's hard to to not be very very loud, and so that's where it takes a lot of us us little guys um, talking really really loudly, um, and and doing it in a way that that shows change instead of just saying like, well, things should be different. Saying here is the different things that we are doing. We are actively working, and and it is working. It is making a difference. You can hear from the people who are part of this system, um, and and to listen and and opportunities like this where you're giving people that are doing this work a voice, I think make make a huge impact. And I got to be grateful for the university for doing that. Uh, Dina, what advice do you have for both undergrads and grad students who wish to actively engage and reduce or eliminate food deserts in their regions? Do your agencies take in student workers at any level of your programs? Yeah, just reach out to me. <laughs> we, we can make something work. And I would say get involved with your neighborhood organization. You'd be surprised how much work they're doing quietly. There are a lot of folks out there doing this work. There are faith-based organizations, you know, in the back of the church or whatever, synagogue or mock. There's a garden back there. There are opportunities available. Um, I have to give a shout out to the University of UMKC, the uh, student pantry that was just recently uh, redone. And, and I'm hearing great things about that. So, yeah, there are oppor- there are opportunities. And certainly, you know, reach out to me and I can probably give you a whole list of things that, that you could do to help out. You know, student pat- pantry just strikes me as su- such an oxymoron. Here, students are spending thousands of dollars to go to school and yet they can't eat 
you know, on the other end, but we do have a great uh, food pantry here. Erica, does a red circle take in uh, interns and the like uh, in St. Louis? Yes, we do. We have a food and justice fellowship that students can go through where they'll learn three topics, um, equity and justice, growing food and STEM, and business and entrepreneurship. And they actually get paid while they're going through the fellowship. So students can definitely contact me and I can get them plugged into that. We also have environmental students that work alongside our fellows. So like they're like peer mentors. And so as the fellows are learning this, um, these topics, then the peer mentors are kind of helping to guide the curriculum, schedule meetings, and they're also learning alongside. They get to go to the farm and they get to go to go to, to policy meetings, planning and zoning meetings. Um, this past wave of the fellowship, people got to sit in on the farm bill listening session with Missouri Coalition for the Environment, which is a way that people can advocate for some of these bigger changes that need to happen in the policy space, advocating for changes in the farm bill. And so, yeah, we definitely, definitely use students um, from all schools, social work um, and environmental studies, public health, all of that. Well, we're going to have to wrap here. And what a good conversation it was. I want to thank our good panelists for taking the time that they did to sort of bring us up to speed on so many of these important issues. Um, we plan to continue this conversation, specifically looking at the state of urban farming in Kansas City and St. Louis during the next installment of university Universities uh, Exchange. That's scheduled for February 7th. We also encourage you to attend the other food-related conversations taking place throughout the UM Systems Extension and Engagement Week, including Thursday morning's All Things Missouri presentation that puts a statewide lens on food insecurity. After this session, uh, all uh, participants will receive an invitation to an online evaluation. Um, the, the chat's moving so fast, I can't keep up with it here. To an online evaluation, and we encourage you to fill that out. Until next time, I'm Steve Prasky, and this has been Universities Exchange. Thanks for joining us today.